And I'm going to uh, now hand it over to, um, to Michael Brownlee. He's a co-founder co of Local Food Shift Group here in um, Boulder, Colorado. And he's going to introduce um, the author for us. So give a hand to Michael. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming tonight. This is a great opportunity. And so I, I wanted to start out uh, by talking a little bit about what's been happening around us. With, with all the devastation in the area, it's, it's just too early to say what the full impact of the storm and all the flooding will be on local agriculture. And the initial reports we've been getting are still pretty spotty. Uh, but it's clear that, that the, uh, the very landscape has been transformed out there in many places. Creeks and rivers have changed course, and precious topsoils have been washed away. And all of this at the peak of the farming season. Crop loss, we know, has been significant uh, because vegetables are rather ill-equipped to deal with 10 to 20 inches of rainfall in a week. Although Dave Asbury out of Full Circle Farms told me today that uh, the lettuce is doing very well with all this water. <laughs> but, but there is no, we know for these farmers, there is no insurance for all these crop losses. We already know that, that uh, Oxford Gardens in Niwot and Bonavita growers uh, were particularly hard hit. And uh, I, I myself would like to nominate Amy Tisdale uh, from uh, Red Wagon Organic Farm for, for maybe the uh, Agricultural Journalist of the Year Award <laughs> uh, for, for the great work that she has done. If you haven't seen it on her website, I, I encourage you to take a look. The, the, the story and the, the large number of videos there gives us a real bird's eye view of what's been happening out on the farms. It's heartbreaking to watch, and yet it's inspiring at the same time. Mark Guttridge out at Olin Farms in Longmont says, yes, these are challenging times, both physically and emotionally, but that is what farming has been about for centuries. From challenges come opportunities for growth, he says, and that is what we're trying to stay focused on. There is much work to do, and we look forward to joining together to transform this disaster into something beautiful. Growing up in, in Yuma County, I know that, that farmers are pretty much allergic to asking for help. But our local growers are going to need all the support that they can get in the coming days and weeks and months ahead. And as a community, I think we need to rally around them. Certainly, we can, we can volunteer to help clear debris, shovel mud, rebuild fences, and maybe even provide shelters to those whose homes have been lost or, or damaged. And I'm, I'm sure that a lot of us are going to be getting very creative about this in the next several days. And more importantly, we can all increase our local food purchasing. At farmers markets, you know, tomorrow uh, farmers market here in, in Boulder will be open. Uh, we can also go to farm stands. We can support our local farmers at some of our local retail stores like the Lucky's Markets, Alfalfa's, Whole Foods, uh, Natural Grocers. And we can all patronize the many restaurants that, that source locally. This all helps our farmers, but most importantly, Let's let our local farmers and food producers know how important they are to us in every way that, they can, that we can. Farming is a precarious enterprise in the best of times. But in times like these, we realize just how fragile our food supply chain really is and how important local food production is to all of us. And we deepen our realization that our over-dependency on a food supply system that is controlled by a handful of transnational agrochemical corporations puts all of us in jeopardy. We're very fortunate tonight to have with us Winona Howder, 
the executive director of Food and Water Watch and the author of Foodopoly, The Battle of the Future of Food and Farming in America, which is a hard-hitting expose of corporate consolidation and control over our food system and what it means for farmers and eaters alike. This is an extremely well-researched book documenting the rise of the global industrial food system and its rapid and near total <coughs> dominance of the way we humans feed ourselves and how it is increasingly wreaking devastating impact on our environment, on our health, on our local economies, and on our communities. This book really is essential reading. Through Winona's eyes, we can see how significant aspects of our lives have actually been colonized by these multinational corporations who seek ever greater control of our food supply and ever greater influence over what and how we eat. How we respond to this challenge could determine the future of life on this planet. So on behalf of Local Food Shift Group, it is our pleasure to co-sponsor tonight's author. And as a writer, I can say that Foodopoly, in Foodopoly, Winona has given us a great gift, helping us to understand our food predicament and what we all must do about it. Please join me in welcoming Winona Howard. Well, it's terrific to be here tonight, and I have to say I'm surprised to see so many people come out. I know your community has gone through a terrible trauma, so thanks so much for coming. So I did grow up on a farm, and that's where I became interested in food. When I was 11, my parents, who were missionaries, decided that it was really time to get back to the farm. My dad had grown up during the Dust Bowl, um, in the 1930s, but still had really sweet memories of uh, living on a farm. So we ended up on a farm about 45 miles from Washington, D.C., um, really ramshackle farm with a mile-long driveway and no plumbing in the house and really rutted uh, road to get in. And my dad never did get around to putting the plumbing in. He didn't think that was very important. And uh, I learned a lot about hard work, you know, um, plucking uh, chicken feathers and uh, pinching potato bugs and chopping kindling. I was an only child. So uh, I, I have to say that when I was 18, I couldn't wait to get away from that farm. But I really learned a lot of valuable lessons, and I think it really shaped uh, uh, who I've become. So um, I ended up inheriting that farm, and uh, my husband, who is the urban person, now runs the farm, and I work in the city doing advocacy with uh, our Food and Water Watch. But um, one of the things that's really frustrated me over the last few years, and really the reason that I wrote Foodopoly is, too often we hear the blame for our dysfunctional food system placed on farmers. And, you know, I think we really need to look at um, the history of food policy and how we've ended up with this really dysfunctional system to know where we need to go in the future. And uh, the thesis of my book is actually that we can't shop our way out of this mess, as wonderful as it is, to have community-supported agriculture, local farmers, and of course we should um, help them thrive, buy their products, but that's not going to be enough right. We're going to need the, the political will, the political action to really change our food system. So I want to talk a little bit tonight about uh, farm policy and where we uh, um, really, how we've ended up here. And I'm going to begin right before World War II, when you'll remember from your history lessons that uh, there was a terrible depression, that rural people were being uh, hit probably the hardest. We lost uh, um, really thousands of farms during that period. And uh, um, we did have 6.8 million farms in the early 1930s. 
And when the Roosevelt administration came into office, they wanted to do something to make it possible for farmers to actually make a living and to make a living on par with uh, uh, urban workers. And so they set about in uh, um, developing some policies that would actually stabilize the price of farm products, of foods, that would keep oversupply from happening, because that's one of the banes of, of farmers all through history, overproduction. They took uh, millions of acres of land out of production, marginal land, that uh, shouldn't have been farmed. They created programs to have a, a basically a price support system for farmers, and a lot of other things that worked really well for agriculture and actually worked well for consumers, too. And during World War II, the U.S. provided food for the Allies. And after the war, uh, when Europe was devastated, when all those colonial governments were falling, uh, U.S. agriculture continued to produce food for, for the world. But um, politics had really changed, and the economic system had changed because of World War II, as we all know. The U.S. had become an industrial power. The center of finance had moved from London um, to the United States. And there were uh, businessmen, um, political leaders, who believed that uh, uh, the time of agriculture was over. And these were... You know, these men were technocrats, and they were men at this period in time. And uh, they believed that technology and capital should replace labor. And actually, they wanted to uh, get a lot of these young men off of the farm and into factories. And a, a group of these leaders got together and um, formed an organization called the Committee for Economic Development. And this was a very influential organization that for about three decades lobbied to get rid of those New Deal policies. And um, these were industrial leaders. One of the founders was uh, the CEO of Studebaker. Another was an executive at Kodak, uh, uh, the, the camera company. Another one was one of the, uh, the first researchers in looking how to uh, uh, change public opinion. And during the first uh, about 15 years of the Committee for Economic Development's existence, 38 of its um, members held public office. Two of its members were um, Federal Reserve Bank chairs. And these were very influential men. And they began chipping away at these policies in the 1950s and 1960s. And uh, by the 1970s, it was becoming more difficult for farmers to make a living. And some of you may remember the name Earl Butts. Uh, Earl Butts um, wanted to help re-elect uh, Richard Nixon, and so he put together a, a big grain deal where the grain traders made several billion dollars and uh, the price of bread went up in the U.S., uh, helped companies like Cargill and ConAgra. But Earl Butts and... Uh, uh, the economic interests that he represented, believed that the real future for U.S. farmers was grains and it was an export economy. And so he used his position as Secretary of Agriculture to travel around the country and to tell farmers to get big or get out, buy a lot of equipment, borrow a lot of money, buy land. And unfortunately, in the 1970s, a lot of farmers took that advice. And there actually never was an export market for grain in the 1970s, except that one year that uh, Earl Butts put that deal together. And so what happens when farmers borrow money, buy land, put their farms up as collateral, and there's no market? Well, they eventually lose their farm. And that was really the beginning of the, uh, um, the agricultural crisis that um, plagues us to this day. In the uh, 1980s, we saw agriculture further impacted by a lot of the policies that the Reagan administration promoted. And in fact, I think a lot of the economic and social problems that we have today really have their root cause uh, from a lot of that deregulation. 
And one of the things that uh, I did in writing Foodopoly is I had the opportunity to interview a man named Michael Perchuk, who was a commissioner at the Federal Trade Commission. And one of the things that the Reagan administration's funders wanted, this is the oil industry, a lot of agribusiness, a lot of uh, uh, very large companies, they wanted to get rid of the antitrust laws that had worked pretty well from the 1940s. And those were the laws that prevent companies from merging or acquiring their closest competitors. So Michael Perchuk told me the story about what happened in his agency, the Federal Trade Commission, and at the Department of Justice in the early 1980s when these Reagan appointees took over these agencies, basically eviscerated our antitrust law and um, doing things that you would imagine, cutting the budget, um, getting rid of whole departments, stopping investigations that were going on, and probably most importantly, dramatically narrowing the definition of what an antitrust violation is. And that's had a really dramatic effect on our society, on our food system, because today in just about any industry that you look at, there's very little competition. And the food industry is particularly uh, consolidated. So what happens when companies get really, really big? Um, well, it means that they get a lot wealthier and they get a lot of political power. And so I think this system of legalized bribery that we have in the United States today um, really um, took off during the 1980s as companies um, started becoming bigger. And if you look at the food industry, um, agribusiness, the agrochemical industries, they've been able to use their wealth to uh, basically weaken all of our consumer protection laws, the, the laws that uh, uh, allow people to be exposed to pesticides and agrochemicals in the food they eat, uh, the laws that have allowed the uh, uh, companies like Monsanto and the biotech industry to control seeds, um, even the laws regulating advertising. And you know, we don't very often hear that children um, see about just under 5,000 TV ads for junk food. So we talk a lot about obesity, uh, but we don't talk a lot about uh, why children want to eat junk food to begin with. And children have brand recognition. They have figured out these companies by the age of three. And children really are, uh, in large part, uh, determine what families eat. And they have an enormous amount of power in, in, fam in families and determining uh, what foods are purchased. And so all of these things have really contributed to uh, a lot of the dysfunction that we see today. But I think probably the, the biggest contributor, along with the consolidation, is what happened in the mid-90s under the Clinton administration. Because what uh, Ronald Reagan began, really Bill Clinton kind of finished in terms of uh, eviscerating uh, antitrust law and allowing companies to have uh, uh, full reign over public policy. And you know, I think you can just look at the media and what happened under the Clinton administration. In the beginning uh, of the uh, um, the administration, there were 50 media companies, large media companies. By the end, there were five large media companies. And a lot of the consolidation that we've seen in the food industry really began, especially with the meat industry. And um, one of the things that the multinationals lobbied for was a trade regime that really isn't about trade, but is more about allowing large multinationals to um, have um, their production and to use labor wherever they want and to move things to where the cheapest uh, production uh, can take place. And that's had a really dramatic effect on our food system in a couple of ways. Number one, when uh, the U.S. became a party to those trade deals, the World Trade Organization and NAFTA being the first big deals under the Clinton administration, one of the things that there was pressure to do 
was to um, get rid of the last vestiges of those protective New Deal policies. So having the USDA at all involved in supply management was eliminated. The grain reserve uh, that helped stabilize grain prices was eliminated. In fact, Cargill and, and the uh, uh, grain traders and food processors had been trying to get rid of the grain reserve for years uh, because uh, they don't want prices to be stable. They want overproduction. And uh, so the legislation that uh, got the uh, U.S. farm policy in line with trade policy was nicknamed by its proponents Freedom to Farm. Very quickly, farmers were calling it Freedom to Fail because what happened is uh, the price of farm products plummeted. So the price of corn went down by about 50%, the price of soy by 40%, and uh, that meant that um, farmers were in really bad shape, and we lost a uh, um, large number of farms during this period as well. And of course, that was um, the um, birth of the subsidy program, because Congress, in its wisdom, rather than reinstituting some of those uh, New Deal policies uh, decided to use taxpayer money to uh, make it possible for some large farmers to continue producing these grains. Um, although farmers, I must say, um, even today with the high corn and soy prices, uh, cannot be assured of making a living or actually uh, uh, being profitable every year. And, you know, so I think it's really important to look at who really benefited from those um, uh, very low grain prices. And we don't often hear a lot about it. Let's look at the soda industry. They saved $2 billion the first couple of years. The meat industry was completely restructured, though. And I think that here in Colorado, you can see a lot of the fallout from that uh, as farmers suffer and... Um, we see a lot of uh, frac leases for gas and oil wells because uh, agriculture isn't profitable. But what happened with the meat industry is that uh, the consolidation began um, really in the early 1990s. So let's look at hog production as an example. In 1992, 30% of hogs were raised on factory farms where lots of hogs are um, housed in these horrible warehouses and don't have enough room to turn around. By 1995, as the uh, meatpacking industry was allowed to consolidate, we saw about 60% uh, of hogs raised on factory farms. By 2007, after cheap corn and soy became available, 95% of hogs were raised on factory farms. And the uh, immediate cause of that was cheap grain and the consolidation in meat packing that makes it impossible for farmers to have a fair market to sell into and are unable to get a, a fair price for their animals. And this very same problem exists in fruit and vegetable production. I went to the Central Valley of California in writing Foodopoly and found that uh, uh, the consolidation is uh, happening in fruit and vegetables, um, just as it has in uh, meat packing. And so, you know, when consumers go to the grocery store, they really think that there's a lot of choice and a lot of different products and diversity, but when you look at who actually owns those products, there are 20 food processing companies that own more than 60% of the brands in the grocery store. And even the organic brands, uh, brands that you purchase at Whole Foods, 14 of these large um, food processing companies also own the largest organic brands. But even these food processing companies aren't on the top of the heap. And when you look at who is really driving um, the, the 
um, unsustainability today. You have to look at the grocery industry as one of the main players. We have four grocery chains that sell in many markets 70 to 90 percent of the groceries. And overall, these four chains uh, sell 50 percent of groceries. One out of three grocery dollars in the U.S. is spent at Walmart. And uh, the Walmart heirs have as much wealth as the bottom 40% of Americans. And, you know, I think that's kind of a metaphor for what's wrong. So people say, well, what's wrong with Walmart um, having such a market share? Don't they sell organic food? Well, what Walmart has done is they have figured out how to squeeze all of the profits from their suppliers all the way down to the, uh, uh, to the farm. And they are driving uh, this move towards consolidation because, you know, let's face it, Walmart buys about a billion pounds of hamburger every year. They don't want to buy from even 10 different meat packers. They're happy with the situation where we have four beef meat packers uh, that control, that sell basically 80% of beef products in this country. And uh, so this volume, this drive to get larger and larger and larger is one of the main problems with our food system. So I really didn't write Foodopoly, though, just to be a bummer about food. <laughs> and usually when I have time, I, I read off uh, uh, the largest food companies' uh, brands and ask people if they've ever eaten any of them, but we don't have time for that tonight. But PepsiCo is the largest uh, food company in the United States, if you consider a lot of the things that they sell as food, mostly it's snack, snack junk food. But... You know, I think that people have to know where we've been to really figure out where we have to go in the future. And I think there are some really big systemic changes that have to be made. But we can't start there. We have to take these really difficult issues and we have to break them down into winnable chunks. And I think that uh, as discouraging as it can be that we've seen some real progress, uh, first of all, we all know that we have a huge food movement today. You've heard Michael uh, talk about it here in, in the Boulder area. And, you know, I think we have the potential to uh, have those people who really care about food do a little bit more. Yes, we should vote with our forks, but we should vote with our votes, and then we need to hold these people accountable. I think one of the most exciting campaigns that I've seen this year is uh, labeling uh, of genetically engineered food. And, you know, I think this time that uh, the biotech industry, the food processors really overreached when they spent that uh, $60 million in California during the last few weeks of the ballot initiative there and, and uh, really made people mad around the country. And we saw legislation in 30-some states, including here in Colorado, didn't pass this time around. but. Uh, legislation did pass in Connecticut, um, and we're going to see more of this legislation pass. And we know that probably in the next couple of years, because the movement is growing so much to label genetically engineered food, that we'll see some kind of uh, federal labeling. And, you know, I think this is just a very good example of how uh, one issue can politicize people, and hopefully we can encourage the people who've gotten involved in that issue to get involved in uh, many of these other uh, issues that are related to our food system and our environment. And uh, I know there's a lot of activity now around antibiotics in animal production, and the CDC came out with a report uh, this last week talking about how um, our antibiotics are losing effectiveness because 80% of them are used in, um, at factory farms, and we're beginning to see a lot of activity around that issue. So, you know, I think we have to take hope from all of these uh, activities. I mean, we look here in Colorado at what's going on in many communities around fracking, 
And I think it's important to make the connections between these different issues. And as I said earlier, really we have this fracking disaster in rural areas where um, the extraction companies, the oil and gas industry, are able to come in and uh, often take advantage of people um, with the leases that they sign and the, the devastation to the water and to the air. They're able to do that because in agriculture, it's been so difficult to make a living for so long and rural areas are so much suffering. So, you know, I think a lot of the activity around fracking can be linked to food and that actually fracking can help uh, build uh, political power around a lot of our food issues. So I think with that, maybe we'll do some um, comments, questions, answers. I was told that um, I had to about 8.10, so that gives us about 10 minutes. Yes. I must uh, tell you, I grew up in Iowa, you know, on an Iowa farm, and I too used an outhouse until I was a sophomore in high school, so we have something in common. Um, <laughs> I also have uh, visited relatives back in Iowa, and the smell of those uh, factory mm -hmm. hog farms yeah. especially is something that, well, nobody wants to yeah. live within four or five miles uh, of them. So my question is, uh, what do you recommend we do? The, 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 the uh, animal uh, farm, the animal, the meat industry is terrible. The crowded <laughs> chickens and pigs and, and everything. And uh, what, what, what are the two or three most important things we can do? I know that the budgets have been cut for agriculture ex uh, uh, inspection for yeah. many, many years, I think perhaps from Nixon on. And uh, we, our meats are not terribly safe anymore. No, that's Plus exactly right. I mean, the food safety issues around the factory farmed meat are um, as serious as the, the problems in the rural communities. Well, I think that if we're really going to change agriculture, we're going to have to be able to impact the farm bill. And the good news is that nobody, uh, most people had not even heard about this thousand page piece of legislation five years ago, except uh, um, you know, wonky people who were uh, working in uh, the halls of Congress. Now, Congress is dysfunctional this time around, and we've been unable to get any farm bill passed, even a bad farm bill passed. But I think that the education around what has to be done, we need a competition title in the farm bill. And you may remember that we won a competition piece in the 2008 farm bill, and it it actually resulted in um, President Obama starting a process to look at the behavior of the meat industry. Now the bad news is, like on so many issues, the Obama administration chickened out. They, uh, there was a hearing here in uh, uh, Fort Collins that had literally hundreds of people testifying about the impact on uh, family farms. And we have to come back and we have to get uh, pressure to begin that process over because we must have a competition title in the Farm Bill as a way to just begin to look at some of this consolidation. And, you know, it, it's not going to happen this time because of the, um, the real dysfunction we have in our political system. But, you know, I think this kind of goes back to a lot of these state issues because one of the reasons that we can't work on the farm bill, that we can't get a lot done in Congress is in so many states we've had so much gerrymandering because every 10 years, of course, um, the state legislatures do the redistricting. And if you don't have a strong public interest movement in the state to have a good legislature, it's going to be very difficult to get uh, a Congress to get a House of Representatives that's actually representative of the people, which we don't have right now. So a lot of this isn't easy. It starts with the political work that has to be done, linking issues like whether it be food or fracking or one of the other important issues to elections and getting people involved in these things again. I mean, if we really want to have a democracy, right? No. Yes. Well, speaking of political action, um, friends of mine were involved in the Longmont movement against fracking. Yes. And I know people at Food and Water Watch were very helpful 
and uh, also heard a representative of yours on KGNU recently, the community radio station. And uh, thank you so much for your group's work, your talk this evening. And I was wondering if you could speak more about Food and Water Watch. And sure. Well, Food and Water Watch is eight years old. It grew out of the public citizen group, um, or the Ralph Nader group, public citizen, where I uh, ran the uh, environment program for 10 years. And we decided that it was time to have an organization really focused on our most important resources. And so we spun Food and Water Watch off. And you know, when Ralph started Public Citizen, you could, you know, public interest advocate in the 70s could kind of waltz into Congress and find some uh, uh, members of Congress who were sympathetic and, you know, get something done. And things did get done. But that has long since changed, and so we decided that we really needed an organization with a base. And so uh, we have offices in uh, 17 states, and we really believe that we have to start at, at the grassroots level, um, changing um, the politics locally, and working to have um, more state legislation that's really beneficial and that gets people involved in state politics so that we can build towards having a Congress that could be more responsive. And we have, a, a Sam, maybe you want to raise your stand up a minute. Our um, Western Regional Director is actually uh, here in Colorado, in Denver, and uh, uh, he is always looking for volunteers and for people to get involved. And uh, we have a sign-up sheet, I think, that's going around. One of the one of the things that we want to do is give people an opportunity to get involved at the using the amount of time that they have. So maybe it's a listserv, but maybe there's more time to really get involved um, deeper in some of these important issues. Yes? So the, the, one of the biggest things that frustrates me is, like you were saying, that there's only four companies that own everything. And I think that part of the issue is People just don't know. I mean, like you said, even in the organics, the number of organic companies that are owned by, you know, Kellogg's, which are, you know, like these Pepsi yes. It's like, how can we, is there, is there a reliable source on the internet for, like, here's the latest, <coughs> and these are the brands that aren't, are still independent, are still kind of, um, you know, well, you know, I think it's, a, it's really hard to shop our way out of the problem. I mean, there are lots of internet sites that you can go to and get information about different brands and, um, you know, different options. But in the, in the end, if you go into a grocery store, um, most of the uh, staples are going to be owned by one of these large companies. I mean, look at milk. Uh, Dean Foods owns 40% of um, uh, conventional milk, 60% of organic milk, and 90% of soy milk. I mean, it's very difficult to get around this. And, you know, I think that's why it's best to eat vegetables and to, you know, and grains and to not eat processed food and that that's probably the, the best protection and to buy locally when you can. Um, but that really what it's going to take to change this is going to be that political action. Yes? I have kind of a specific question about the farm bill, and I'm, I, you might not be able to answer it. Yeah, but, I might not. But I'd like to <laughs> I'll try. a question about political change in reference to it. I believe the way it's written, uh, there is government subsidies and grants for people getting into the getting into farming, like family farms, if the town is 50,000 or smaller. Broomfield is about 60,000 and growing rapidly, so it's too big. I'm wondering if there's a way that we could uh, politically uh, change that number to a town of a million and say we can grow food within the city limits of a million population and start shifting the idea that we could come up with 20% of our diet or 40% of our diet, even locally, 
and, and the lands that I'm kind of uh, focusing on, uh, besides the government, the two largest land owners in the country are the railroad and the churches. Mm -hmm. If we could just get church land and railroad land and work a like a one to five acre farm every five miles in every direction across the country, we could feed ourselves 30% mm -hmm. of our diet or 50%. But it would take, you know, the amount of subsidies that go into the railroad, you know, if there would be some way that the government could say, okay, we'll continue to subsidies if, or, I mean, it'd be a huge uh, shift. But it's going to take that in order to just stop buying. Yeah the crops that come genetically modified. But we have to have an alternative, you know? We can't just say, okay, we're not gonna buy these anymore, and we, you can't mm -hmm. afford. So anyway, is that kind of a grand scale um, of political change in agribusiness, agriculture, what you're talking about in food uh, Well, I am, but I think it's building the political power. I mean, right now we're operating under the um, 2000, a piece of the 2008 Farm Bill that actually zeroed out a lot of the programs that you're talking about that uh, Vice President Biden um, and Majority Leader came up with and, uh, you know, in Congress isn't even, well, there's a Senate Farm Bill uh, right now, but the House can't even decide on a Farm Bill. So, you know, all of these things are possible in a farm bill if we build the political power to actually change things. And part of what we've looked at, we've looked at the last um, five farm bills and where the committee members actually are from. And surprisingly, um, or maybe not surprisingly, they tend to be from uh, the same states and areas. Um, the South, uh, the Midwest often. And those are the areas that um, we may be the weakest. So I think there's going to have to be a, a shift of public interest resources and attention to try to uh, hold some of these really important members of Congress who really do determine what farm policy is in this country accountable before a shift like that can happen. But that's what it's going to take. I mean, we always say it's true for energy, too. We, you know, we had the Manta Manhattan Project, right? Uh, and uh, had a, uh, a big advancement in nuclear technologies. We need a Manhattan Project for uh, sustainability, energy sustainability, and uh, to prepare for what's happening with climate change. So I totally agree. Yes? Can you speak to uh, what the agribusiness has done to our freedom of speech? You mean the ag-gag laws? Yeah. Well, you know who's really behind that is the, uh, well, it is the agribusiness and the, um, the Chamber of Commerce, but it's the vehicle that they have used is ALEC, that uh, trade association, the right-wing trade association for state legislators. And uh, they came up with model legislation that they, um, handed out to um, all of the state legislate, legislatures, their uh, members in those legislatures, and that's how uh, these ag-gag bills uh, actually came about. Now, all of the, the ones that were introduced this um, last legislative session, I think there were 11, but don't quote me on that. They were all defeated. Uh, there were two that um, were from a couple of years ago. So there have been coalitions that have come together in um, states across the country to stop this, um, you know, this ag-gag uh, process. Yes? Uh, with regard to the uh, consolidation issue, the corporations buying all the farmland, uh, a couple of states, I think Nebraska and South Dakota, have passed laws prohibiting corporations from owning farmland, or only farms, operating farms. Have you seen that movement uh, grow at all to expand to other states? Well, unfortunately, I don't think those laws uh, exist anymore. I know for uh, a fact in Nebraska, because I've talked to the Nebraska Farmers Union about this, their uh, corporate ag law was overturned. Um, so we don't have any any state, as far as I know, in the union that prohibits corporate-owned farming. So it was politically 
it, it was a judge that did it. Because what happens when you have a, when the politics aren't um, going in the right direction, then the judges that are appointed um, don't protect our democracy too. So uh, it's all connected, right? It, it would be that, yes. I mean, that's one of the things that we need to do, right, if we're going to have a local economy, is have jobs in the rural sector. So you're exactly right. Yes? Well, I don't know whether it's a question or comment, but in, when they passed the Clean Water Act in the late 80s, and they had to figure out what to do with human sewage, and now I, I suspect if I ask you what your opinion is of class B biosolids, that they mislabel as being organic and they sell them at every home depot and every Lowe's and now you even got Kellogg's putting out a product called Advent that they biosolids they they changed that one to organic compost. And I yeah. think that even some people I run into people at the farmers market that didn't know about this stuff. And I've done just a ton of research on biosolids, you know, sort of like yeah. the the greatest pollutant that's ever been invented in the century. And um, and they're using it. On farm I mean, we're land. in the middle of, I think, probably the greenest state, certainly the greenest county in the greatest state and the greenest city. But in Boulder County, you know, Walmart gives away biosolids to farmers for free, so they're happy to use them. Yeah. And they're putting heavy metals and everything else in the soil permanently. Well, that's one of the things that we need to do, right? Get all of those chemicals out of our waste so it can be composted and used. And, you know, I'll just end by saying we're going to have to do it. We're going to have to do it because of climate change and because in 25 years we will run out of some of the main um, fertilizers that are necessary and that aren't produced in this country, the, the basic ingredients. We're going to need to go back to diverse, diversified agriculture. The, one of the things that I find that people really don't know about in this state is that Well County has the highest number of cattle in concentrated agricultural feeding out cattle of any county in the United States. They've got 750,000 cows up there that produce 40,000 pounds, 40 million pounds of manure a day, which voluminizes, puts a whole bunch of greenhouse gases into the air, and then we wonder why the climate is changing in Rocky Mountain. Well, I think it's also the county that has the most fracking wells, right? 19,000, and that many of those have um, the, the uh, open waste pits and the containers for that flow back uh, and produced water uh, have spilled in this uh, um, dreadful flood. So I think that what happens in that county is um, going to be really important about water quality. But I don't want to stop on such a negative note. Really, really. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of activity and a lot of um, interest and enthusiasm. I've seen it as I've traveled around with Foodopoly. People are really fed up and they really want to fight for what they want. And they're doing that in their own community. And, you know, I have a lot of hope for the future. So. Look forward to working with you all for uh, creating a, a sustainable future for our kids. Thank you.